one of the things I've always been contemplating for the last year, few years is that many, many people like to come and do meditation retreats. But we still you know, have lovely facilities, but we're still using the old meditation cushions that they used hundreds of years ago. And surely we can start to have high-tech meditation cushions instead of just these ordinary low-tech ones. And if there's any business people who want to support the BGF, why not start a high-tech meditation cushion company? I have all the features worked out many, many years ago. First of all, you have a remote control so that if your backside needs to be lifted up, you press one button and air gets uh, put into the cushion so it raises you up. And if one knee needs to be raised up a bit, that can be raised up another cushion. If your uh, backside is too cold, you can heat it up. Like you've seen these cars they have in Europe, the seat can warm up. And even if they have a backrest on it, like some of these other seats I've seen on the aircraft, you can press another button, you get a massage in the back. And if you have sloth and torpor, that's very easy too. You press another button and you get a choice. You can have a coffee, a latte, or a <laughs> black, or a cup of tea. And you put your cup there and it comes straight out so you don't need to get up. So those are called like <laughs> high-tech meditation cushions. And you can also have another sort of button that's controlled by the teacher. And if you get sloth and torpor, the teacher presses the button, you get an electric shock. <laughs> so that'll be high-tech high meditation cushions. And I'm sure that each one of you can probably add a few extra, <laughs> extra features just in case. But anyway... There's a lovely thing about when you do meditate, you get an intuitive mind, innovative mind, you can start to see things in different ways and also have a bit of fun with your meditation practice. In other words, see different ways of doing different things. And it's also, I'm not going to do it today because I did this in Penang a few years ago. I was describing walking meditation and how a few people have adapted the walking meditation to be more culturally appropriate in countries like Australia. So what they do in the meditation, walking meditation halls, they stand at one end and they put their feet together and they put their hands, usually when you're doing walking meditation, you put your hands in front of you where they're nice and comfortable. Uh, when you're doing walking meditation, don't put your hands on either side, walking like a robot. <laughs> We're then more comfortable. But to make it more interesting, in places like Australia, they put their hands in front of them, like this. <laughs> and they don't walk, they hop. <laughs> we, call, we, call <laughs> we call that kangaroo walking meditation. And honestly, it's not just a joke, because when one person does that, and other people see you doing kangaroo walking meditation, it gives a boost of energy and happiness and joy to everybody who's seeing it. And I know this one occasion when I was in Penang, they said, can you please explain that in more detail, and how to do kangaroo walking meditations? So there's no one else I could force to do it, so I had to do it myself. And I thought, that's okay. But then as soon as I started, you wouldn't believe how many mobile phones come up. <laughs> and they videoed it and put it on, on YouTube. <laughs> but anyway, that lightheartedness is sometimes very important. Because that lightheartedness gives you the opportunity to find peace, happiness and joy in whatever you're doing. It means you start to engage with the meditation process rather than just enduring it. Doing a meditation retreat is not like going to the dentist. 
Are there any dental practitioners here? Any dentists? Oh, one, okay. So you can put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> Now that sometimes the dentists, we look upon them, in the old days anyway, when I was young, when I went to the dentist, they were really scary. They had all these sharp tools, you had to sit down in a chair, and if you had to have a tooth out, they had to inject you with, now not these lovely needles these days, they were really hard needles, and you know, they came in and pushed all the stuff into your mouth, it was very scary. But anyway, these days I know that dentists are very, very, far more advanced but I don't know about dentists in front of me now but many of the dentists when they have you in the chair they start asking you questions and having a conversation and I can't answer back <laughs> I've got all this stuff in my mouth but I did get one piece of good advice or an idea because I know that sometimes when people meditate you get lots of saliva in your mouth and people often ask me that question, if you get lots of saliva when you're meditating, what do you do? Just allow it to dribble down your cheek and onto your shirt? And that's not very sort of a nice thing to see. And I said it's a very simple technique to overcoming excess saliva in your mouth while you're meditating. And that is to borrow one of those machines they have in the dentist, little things to put in your mouth. <laughs> To get the saliva out of your mouth. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bit too disturbing. A lot of these things, just to answer that question more appropriately, the more you worry about it, the more the saliva comes out. When you just relax, okay, just let it be. It stops by itself. And that's something which often happens in meditation. The more you worry about something, the more you try and control it, the more you try and do something, usually the worse it becomes. And this was an example of something which happened to me when I first went to, to Thailand as a young man, and that's when we had all of these mosquitoes in the forests. I just come here and it just, it's a lovely place to meditate. There's no mosquitoes at all here, at least not where I live. In your places, are there any mosquitoes bothering you? Just one? Sorry? A little bit, oh, okay. But anyway, if they, they do come into your room or come into the hall, what should you do? Now this is a nice hall. It's air-conditioned, it's got lovely windows on it, but when you meditate in a the forest, there's no windows at all. And I don't know why Ajahn Chah did this. The first year I was a monk, that's when we started Wat Banana Chat. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, that was not its original name. Its original name <clears throat> given by Ajahn Chah was Wat Ba America Wat. Because most of the monks there were, were from the United States. But anyway, we changed it when there's other monks, like monks from England and stuff, me. <laughs> So we changed it to Wat Banana Chat. But anyway, just to get interest in that monastery started, Ajahn Chah would come every evening. And he would meditate for an hour or two, and then we would have a talk. The problem was, when he came, it was about 6 o'clock. 6, maybe 6.30, and that's when we would start meditating at 6.30 in the evening in the forest, the jungles of Thailand. About 6.30 is what we call mosquito dinner time. And you probably heard the story before, but every story which I tell, you may have heard it many times, but I've heard it more times than you have. <laughs> and that was when the mosquitoes would come out, would cover your arms. And this, again, I remember this clearly, together with another monk, who was an American monk, we were just sat next to each other, and we would just as something to do, because it was very hard to watch your breath when you were being bitten by so many mosquitoes. 
and so we decided just to have a little game, see who could count the most mosquitoes on your arms and on your head and anything else which is exposed, like your hands. And we get to about 60 or 70. That's a lot of mosquitoes. So many, if you listen carefully, you could hear them slurping your blood away. <laughs> now that was an exaggeration. But it was very irritating. And the only reason you didn't run away because you, know, you opened your eyes and you saw your teacher, Ajahn Chah, sitting there perfectly still. And so it was embarrassment kept you sitting there. So afterwards we'd ask Ajahn Chah, can we use some mosquito coils? Or can we have some mosquito repell repellent or sit inside somewhere? And he said, no. He said, but you know, these mosquitoes, they're torturing us. And he said, no. From now on, please look at those mosquitoes as your teacher. Ajahn Mosquito, who was supposed to call them. And it may sound that's a really cool thing to say. But it actually just works so well. Many of the things which I thought that monkeys just doesn't understand, he did understand much more than I'd imagined. Because we started calling them actual mosquitoes. And what those mosquitoes taught me was how to meditate. So you knew that you know you had a few minutes before those mosquitoes could really find you. So you did your meditation properly. You didn't sort of mess around. So with that meditation, the first thing which I do and encourage each one of you to do, I have mentioned this earlier, is when you sit down, just check your body is comfortable. So, you know, I see already some of you got your legs you know, half up. Some of you are just uh, getting a posture which shows that your body is aching or hurting or something. I was very pleased to see one of the monks sitting in a chair. Thank you for that. The reason I say thank you was because if a monk sits in a chair, it makes it more acceptable for you to sit in a chair. And so that's a wonderful thing to do for your comfort of your body. So that's the first thing I always do when I meditate, to check my legs and check my bottom, check my back, to make sure that everything is comfortable. And as I go through that, usually you call it sweeping of your body, sweep your attention, I do the CT scan. I always start at my feet. And the reason I start at my feet sometimes is my toes. Because I found that even something as so-called insignificant as your toes, you can develop awareness of. And with the practice, all it really is, is that your brain and your toes are getting a connection together. You're creating those neural networks so you can feel what's happening in your toes. And I know that feeling when my toes are comfortable. It's a special feeling you don't have any other place in your body. Comfortable toes. I relax them to the max. That's why that saying, which is now on people's t-shirts, relax to the max. That is not a joke either, that's incredibly deep. The relax to the max meditation. So you relax your toes so you can actually feel them being at ease and being very comfortable. And that's one of the things I never expected when I experimented with these techniques is that when you relax your toes you get some joy. It's a pleasant feeling to have relaxed toes. And then you just go up to your feet. And now my feet can become so sensitive, as I mentioned in passing, when you're doing walking meditation, you can actually walk on the wood, and it's got a very beautiful feeling. Up in my room, there's a carpet. It's actually pretty similar to this carpet. And it's quite rough, it's not expensive carpet. You can actually feel its sensations on your soles of your feet. My feet are now really sensitive. And if ever I've, those times when I've done guided meditation over Zoom and put it out onto the internet, often when I'm sitting on a chair, which you have to, 
in order to be in front of the camera to do a Zoom uh, session. That often when I do that, I can actually feel my feet on the carpet, and it just feels very delightful. And this is how you develop that awareness of your body. When you relax, it always feels delightful. I just scan that uh, attention up my body. When I'm scanning it up my body, say I get to the calves of my two legs, when I get to the calves, I regard you know, the, my lower legs as if I regard each one of you. When I first saw you, right, you know, Victor, I asked, how are you, Victor? You know, I want to make sure that you know, you're a good friend, I've known you for many years, make sure you're happy and well. Or you see the monks, I've only just met many of you, but I'd always want to find out, make sure that you're comfortable, relaxed, happy. And that's exactly how I regard my lower legs. They're friends, not possessions. I care for them rather than controlling them. When I care for them that way, it's as if we connect. If there's any problem there at all, they will let me know. I can feel them if they're not properly uh, put up in the correct position. And I go past there to my knees. My knees, yes, I've fallen off ladders, had motorbike accidents when I was young. I don't know if you can recall or you can even imagine how I'm riding a motorbike, vroom, 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 with long, <laughs> long hair. <laughs> That's when you were young. But anyway, a couple of times you fell off, very lucky to survive. But, you know, the knees is also playing sports. And the knees can be very easily injured. They can sort of heal when you're young, but then when you get older, they can start to, those old injuries can actually start to ache or give you pain. But even though I've had injuries on my knees, I'm so aware of them, you can relax them. What happens when you relax those old injuries is you allow this overreaction of overprotection of a wounded area to let that disappear. And when it disappears, the good energies of your body can come in and heal that part of your body. I'm going to go off on a tangent again now, but I do recall when I started med teaching meditation many, many years ago, now this was before Jhana Grove, we used to use another center which we hired to teach meditation. But anyway, that during one of the meditations, or rather afterwards, in the interviews, one of the women there said that when she was meditating, she was very peaceful, very calm, very aware, but then her shoulders and her neck became very warm. It was like a fever there, but a very comfortable fever, and it was just located in her shoulders and neck. And it was very warm. And so I asked her, when did you have your motor car accident? I remember this because she looked at me. I never told you that. How do you know I had a motor car accident? Ah, at last. Ajahn Brahm, you have powers. You've read my mind and know my past. And I said, no, it's not powers. It's just a little bit of logic. Because I know that that warm feeling you had in your shoulders and neck was that what happens when you relax so much that you stop uh, overly protecting these parts of the body which need some healing. What has happened? You've just relaxed and now the body's own energies, what in Chinese medicine they call qi, in the um, Indian medicine they call the winds, the water, which actually runs through your body, now they can actually go there. You're not blocking them anymore. And when they start to accumulate in one part of the body, it does feel warm, very pleasantly warm. So I mention that to you, if any of you, when you're meditating here, have what these days I call hot spots in your body. Wonderful. Even if you want to get a little bit excited, yes, yeah, something's happening, some healing is occurring. 
and you let that happen and afterwards you always feel so much more relaxed even though I mention this because you know, I already said in the earlier talk I spent a lot of time working with people with cancers and if you get hot spots in your body and you don't know what the heck's going on but it feels hot, it feels wonderful, it feels relaxing great! A new woman will have hot spots in your breasts yes! you're avoiding a breast cancer you're allowing the body to do the healing rather than all these other medicines and other procedures and it works you can feel it happening and it feels so good afterwards so another example many years ago there was a monk in Bodhinyana Monastery many years ago and he would always have problems sitting meditation because his back was so sore no matter what posture he had, even sitting on the chair, his back was always sore if he meditated too long. So, sent him to a doctor. The doctor did a CT scan on his back and gave him the news that he had a, a congenital, congenital defect in his spine. It wasn't the same as other people's spines. And he said because of that, he would always have pain in the back, there was no surgery or, or drugs available to heal him and they said well the best thing is don't meditate for too much he said I'm a monk that's like telling a cook not to eat <laughs> so the doctors couldn't help him so he managed to get a book written by a New Zealand physiotherapist like call something like heal your own back and the uh, method which this New Zealand physiotherapist suggested was that to get to be more aware of your back especially this uh, author said on either side of your spine there are muscles you simply aren't aware of so in order for you to become aware of those muscles he told this monk to, to every morning for about half an hour on each side of the spine to rub those muscles, to stroke them every morning half an hour on each side and then after two or three months he could feel those muscles without needing to touch them or stroke them the same way that I can now feel my toe muscles. I could never feel those before. Because I've just been watching them for such a long time, the brain has now got that neural connection with my toes. And next they said, once you got, you can feel the muscles in your feet, sorry, the muscles on either side of your back, now use trial and error to expand them, to stretch them and then to sort of let them be loose again just the same way that you learned how to use your hands or you learned how to walk when you were a kid all of these things you can learn how to stretch this muscle, stretch that muscle because you have awareness first of all, you're mindful of those muscles on either side of your spine now you can learn trial and error how to move them and he soon learned how to move those muscles and said now the next step, the final step is to exercise them every morning like stretch them up, stretch them down, stretch them up, stretch them down it's just like the way you've been very kind to me I don't know why you did this but thank you so much all the organizers of this retreat is to making sure the lift doesn't work <laughs> so now I have to do exercise <laughs> my great gratitude to you all but anyway <laughs> but somebody said it might be fixed today if it does it's okay you can't you know sometimes you have too much exercise <laughs> I don't think you're going to get away with that but anyway so he could exercise the muscles on either side of his spine till his muscles got so strong they fully compensate for the weakness in the skeletal bones 
you can meditate, no more pain. I like that example because this is where you know, through meditation and building up that awareness to how your body is working, especially parts which we need extra attention. It's amazing what you can do to relax, to heal, to open it, your, that part of the body up to nature's way of healing and amazing things happen to you. Okay, I'm on this subject. Again, on one of those retreats, there was this gentleman, he wasn't even a Buddhist. He did become a Buddhist. This is how to convert people to Buddhism, if you really want to. The, he came on the retreat, and the very first day of this retreat, people started to complain. I had all these questions on my table. Can you please tell meditators to breathe quietly? Because this gentleman was breathing very loudly through his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you've heard that for about an hour, and you know the next meditation will be the same, <laughs> a lot of people became irritated. But then I announced to people that why that man was breathing through his mouth so loudly was because he had a big tumor in his sinus. His doctors had given up on him. He was just preparing to die and just giving meditation, you know, maybe one chance of healing his cancer. Who knows, nothing else was working. You know, as soon as I mentioned that, why the man was creating so much noise, no one complained anymore. They had so much kindness and compassion to this man. It's the same if you see anybody here so sort of annoying you, irritating you. When you know the causes behind this, a lot of times you just can't be irritated anymore. You have more compassion to people rather than blaming them. So even that one time in our center in Perth, this woman came up uh, into the meditation. Once I started teaching meditation, she lay down on the ground. Her feet were pointing to the Buddha. But worse than that, she started to snore while she was meditating, loudly. And so the people next to her woke her up. And I told those people off afterwards, if somebody needs to sleep like that, please let her. This was many years ago. She was a victim of domestic violence. And she only came to our Buddhist center just as an escape, a safe place where she could come and not feel fear that her partner was going to hit her. And if any of you have suffered from domestic violence, you may have a kind of fear of what she was going through. When she came into the meditation hall in our city centre in Perth, it was one of the first times in weeks she had felt safe. And she was so exhausted she sat down, she, so not sat down, she lay down and fell fast asleep. And afterwards I told people, look, if ever that happens again, just go and find a pillow for her, or a blanket, and tuck her in. It doesn't matter which way that her feet are pointing, the, the Buddha wouldn't mind. If he's giving a person who's got so much physical suffering a chance to have a break and a rest. So all of these things, you do actually find that with a bit of kindness, you're not sort of irritated anymore. But this man, who was, had the sinus cancer, and giving meditation one chance to maybe do something to heal him, after nine days of retreat, this man was still breathing as loud as ever. It didn't work. But the reason I tell this story, <laughs> because I had already packed my stuff and was in the car waiting to be driven 
to Sydney Airport to come back to Perth. And he came running to the car. I said, bro, 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 wait, wait. And I said, what happened? And he said, the last meditation of the retreat. And it's nearly always the last meditation of the retreat. If anybody wants to leave today, great. You'll have your best meditation. <laughs> and then you can cancel that and stay another day. <laughs> but the idea of making it the last, because you're not trying anymore. You've given it anything, everything you've got, it doesn't work, so what do you do? You let go. You give up. You renounce. You don't want anything. <laughs> and that's what he did. And he said he heard this popping sound in his nose. And he could breathe again through his nose. That's why he was so excited. He said it only lasted for one minute. But he could actually breathe. And that was so exciting for him. He had to come and tell me. And I just told him, just, you know, just carry on. And quite honestly, I thought he left it too late to learn meditation, just at the last minute. But nevertheless, I wished him well. And six months later, around six months, I was in Sydney for another reason, giving a talk somewhere. And this gentleman came up to me and he said something which please don't ever say to me. Do you remember me? <laughs> and honestly, that sometimes this, some of this Sri Lankan gentlemen, do you remember me? I went to your talk in, uh, in BMICH, which is a big convention center, about 10,000 people. I was there, do you remember me? <laughs> there were 10,000 others there. But anyway, I, as a monk, I have to be honest. So I said, I don't remember you. Who are you? And he said, I was that gentleman with the sinus cancer. And it's fair enough because you know somebody dying of cancer, just they look weak. They look like they're really sick of dying. You know, not much muscles on them. There's no sort of light in their eyes. And he said, I carried on your meditation method. The cancer's now in full remission. Thank you. Stories like that, I love telling others because I like hearing it myself again. It's a beautiful story. And he said he's going to spend the rest of his life, however long he's got, teaching other people how to do this meditation. So that for him, it worked. An incurable sinus cancer just vanished. So anyway, that's what happens when you become aware of your body and know how it works. You can actually give this great peace and kindness to parts of your body and they do relax and healing can happen. So I do that as I go up my body you know, from the knees to the thighs, from the thighs to the butt. I kind of really interested in feeling the sensations in my bottom. I've got a very heavy body, but please, it's, it's, I did say the other day it was fat. It's not fat. I worked this out many years ago. Look, Mark, you've seen how much I eat. I don't eat that much. But anyway, that it's not fat. I've been a monk over 48 years now. It's a long time to be a monk. And every year that you are a monk, you grow in kindness. I think, Victor, you know me for such a long time. Am I a kind monk? You're not, not sure? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, every year you grow in kindness. In other words, every year you, your heart grows bigger. And my heart has grown so much, and even actually 10 or 15 years as a monk, my heart grew so big, you could feel it pressing against your ribcage. You didn't have anywhere else to go. As compassion grew inside of me, my heart expanded so much, it pushed down and went out. <laughs> Just the sign of a big heart. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, 
So anyway, that just being aware of just my butt sitting on the cushion, when I start, it can never be free of that feeling of pressure on those muscles of your bottom. But what you do notice, as long as it's reasonably comfortable, a kind of even feeling, after a while that feeling disappears. You know, when I go further up my body, by the time I get to my shoulders and my arms, you can't feel the bottom anymore. This is one of the important things to know in meditation. You don't need to have perfect comforts in your butt. All you need to do is to check it out and make sure it's okay. It's like you're recognized. You're recognizing these parts of your body. Just like each one of you, just you know, to smile at you because I've known you for a long time and thank you for coming. There's many of you I recognize who've been to my retreat such a long time. And when I see you, I can smile at you, you know that I recognize you. And once you do recognize someone, you actually feel that you can relax much more, you feel safe. And that's very much what my bottom feelings are like. You know, we're still here, are you okay? And I say, yeah, look, I'm recognizing you, just I'll do the best I can. And then after a while, the bottom feelings vanish. You can't feel them anymore. You're comfortable. Do the same with my back. Because many people have sore backs. And because I meditate so many hours, I've got to make sure that I don't put my back in a position where it's going to get really, really uncomfortable. I'll have to pay for that afterwards. So I feel my back. And I make sure it's comfy. Go out to my shoulders. The way I relax my shoulders, that someone asked you know, last night about the visualization, I do do a visualization with my shoulder muscles. I imagine that they're being pulled apart by four invisible monsters, little demons, imps, inside my body, stretching them. And I just imagine that those little invisible demons stretching my shoulder muscles letting go. Letting go, they just stop holding on to things. My shoulder muscles relax. No one is stretching them. And I can feel this very easily. Those shoulder muscles become really loose and comfortable. I just go down my arms, go to my wrists. I don't have many injuries in my wrists or my uh, elbows, even though that I did used to work so hard, again, falling off ladders. I remember one time we were cleaning some gutters and then the ladder slipped, I was holding onto the gutter. And then I shouted out, help! And it's amazing how mindful these monks are. I saw them all looking at me. I said, help, do something. <laughs> they were too equanimous. <laughs> but anyway, I managed to hold on long enough until somebody got the ladder up again. But sometimes you do fall down. The one thing I try and remember, if at all possible, if you fall down, you know what you're supposed to do if you fall from a height? Relax to the max. Can you remember why when babies fall, they don't get injured? They don't tense up. If you relax to the max, you don't tend to break any bones. As far as I know, in my whole life, I've never broken a bone. It's weird, isn't it? Actually, I'm kind of proud of that. I've fallen off motorbikes, but never broke anything. Maybe I have a natural relaxation inside or some heavenly beings are looking after me, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, so when you relax your shoulder muscles, and then when I go through this relaxation process, you go up to your neck, and often you might see me just moving my head around, because that's where I'm finding the optimum comfortable position. Because sometimes I see people, their head is so straight. You're going to get a pain in your neck sooner or later. I've shown to one side, or too far forward. 
when it's nicely balanced, it feels good. And the next thing which I go up to is the muscles of my face. And one of the reasons I do this, please excuse me, was when the first time I came to Malaysia, I cannot remember the year, it was in the 90s, I found that out anyway. When I started coming to Malaysia, so many people were complaining about Samadhi headache. And that kind of shocked me. In all the years of meditating in Thailand, giving talks in Thailand, going to other countries, teaching in Australia, that's the first time I'd ever heard of meditation headache. I tell people, if you have headaches, meditate to get rid of them, not to create them. And I was wondering, why are people doing, what they're doing wrong, they get meditation headache. And it soon became quite clear when I found out that so many people in Malaysia at the time were starting their meditation by focusing on the tip of their nose. And this is what happens. Again, I'm going to take my glasses off so you can see what's actually happening. And I'm now going to meditate by watching the tip of my nose with my eyelids open. So I'm now just meditating on the tip of my nose. So look what my eyes are doing. You've got your eyelids closed, but what happens is because your mind is looking at that, your eyes tend to look at that as well. So under your eyelids, you're spending a half an hour, 45 minutes or 50 minutes. Screwing up your eyes like this, that will give anybody a headache. So meditation is learning how to relax to the max. Not focusing to the point that you're creating a headache and tension. So. One of the last things I do before I leave my body alone is focus on the muscles in my face. When you focus on those muscles of your face, you can feel tension sometimes around the eyes, around the mouth, along your head. That shows you there's something which needs to be addressed first. What's causing that tension? A lot of it is fear, expectation. It could be some manifestation of some psychological um, emotion which is troubling you. It's one of the reasons why you can look at people's faces and you can often read if they're troubled, if they're anxious, if they're sad, if they're happy. Because your facial muscles react to the emotional world inside. So if you can relax those muscles around your eyes and around your mouth and your forehead, other places on your face, a great way of relaxing your mind to get the worst parts of mental agitation away. And if you can do that, you feel peaceful. And once that happens, I usually allow just my attention to feel the whole of the body. When it feels the whole of the body, the complete body. I usually don't stop because you did discover that if you keep relaxing the body and making sure there's not one part of it which is still tight or tense, then it starts to feel very delightful. I enjoy that bodily relaxation. Just the same way that if any of you go to a beach, go on a recliner and just lay down there and just relax to the max, or you go in a hot tub, or you get a body massage, or whatever else you do to relax the body. Does that feel pleasant? It feels really delightful. But what I noticed is once I focus on the delight of relaxation, the relaxation goes deeper. And I didn't realize at the time this also explained to me why in some of those meditations, you're watching the breathing saying, the breathing becomes delightful. You notice that delight, and your breathing gets even more relaxed. Being observ observant of the 
Piti Sukha, the delight in happiness, along with the meditation, is important as a route to take your meditation into even deeper levels. So I learned that with the body. Then when the body is so relaxed, you can let it go. And it doesn't disturb you. Yes, I'm sure that each one of you, before you came here, you made sure that your, your house, your parents, your friends knew where you were going. They were all relaxed about you coming on a retreat as much as you possibly could. And so that when you came here, you got nothing to worry about. Which means you can let go of all your duties and concerns. Same as me, I've got big monasteries to run over in Australia somewhere. Just make sure to the best I can to make sure everything is okay over there and I can just leave it. Don't have to be worried. I'm on holiday from Australia. And if they ring up, say, I'm sorry, Ajahn Brahm is not here. He's never been here. Who is Ajahn Brahm anyway? Which part of him are you looking for? Is Rupa Kanda, Vedna Kanda, Sanya Kanda, Sankara Kanda, Vinyana Kanda? None of them are here, really. Anyway, it's a good way of learning how to be absent, so you can be free. So, these are ways of starting the meditation, and it's also you're learning how to develop the mindfulness and kindness, the same mindfulness and kindness, which can allow your body to be relaxed, also relaxes your mind as well. So as soon as the body is relaxed and I feel the delight of relaxation, I stay there for a few minutes and then I let that disappear and go to the mind. Now straight away people might ask, but what is the mind? And you ask three meditation teachers and you get four explanations. <laughs> Everyone's got a different explanation. So instead, to make it easy, I usually ask you, how peaceful are you? Because peace is one of those qualities which describe the mind. Peace doesn't live that much in your body, but peace lives in your mind. If you want to know where the garden is, go and ask where the trees and the flowers and the bushes are. It's those trees and bushes which define the thing we mean garden. And the peace is one of those things which define what a mind is, or the peace or the lack of it. So when I ask you how peaceful you are, straight away you'll start to look at this thing we call the mind. And it's one of the most important parts of the mind, your peacefulness. So once you start to see that peace, or the lack of it, then you ask why. Why is the mind peaceful? What creates more peace? You look at the causes and effects. And one of the things which creates peace in the mind is the same thing which creates relaxation in the body. Just attention, mindfulness, and the kindness. So be kind to your mind. As I said earlier, that for many years my mind was wandering away. And I would fight it to try and bring it back. But then what happened was it kept on going and going and going. And it took a while before I thought, why? Why does my mind want to wander away so much? And it became very clear that it's because my mind was scared of me. This is a metaphor. Just like if you have a friend and you're always telling them what to do. Look, a good example of this, which I gave in one of the books, I forget which. Suppose, uh, you know, after the retreat, you have a day off and someone calls you up. Hey, are you free this afternoon? I said, yeah. And they say, I found this wonderful coffee shop in PJ. The coffee is really delicious. You must come with me this afternoon and taste some of this coffee. 
and you must come at this time, we'll stay there for an hour, and then you'll sit in the back, I know you like to sit in the front, but I prefer the back. We want to talk about a lot of your spiritual stuff. That's really boring to me. We've got to talk about politics. Politics is really important. And you will have uh, a flat white. Is that right? Coffee? I, I know so little about the world because somebody said, do you want a coffee? I said, yeah, what do you want in it? Whatever you got. Because I don't really know these terms. Do you want a flat white? And he said, you have a flat white because that's what I like. I know you sometimes like lattes, but you have a flat white. We we'll talk about politics. We we'll sit in the back at this particular time for one hour. If someone asks you to go to a coffee shop telling you what to drink, what to talk about, where to sit, for how long, how would you react? You wouldn't want to go, would you? You'd find some excuse. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go to the dentist. <sighs> Now, imagine how your mind feels, your mind, when you tell it, we're going to sit for one hour. We're not going to do what you want to do. We're going to watch the breath, okay? I know you don't like doing that, but we're going to watch the breath. It'll be good for you. <laughs> you try and find an excuse to do something else. The thing about some people is fall asleep. No one likes to be with a control freak. Imagine somebody else gave you a call and said, Hey, you know, this you've been I know how much you love coffee. There's a new coffee shop in the area. You say, Yeah. But I know I don't know what coffee you like, but it serves all types of coffee. And they've got comfortable seats all over the shop. Do you want to go there? We can drink the coffee you like drinking, sit where you like to sit. But also I know you're really keen on this meditation. I want to find out about it. Can you come? We can talk about meditation and Buddhism and the Dhamma. And what would you say? Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm going to cancel that dentist appointment I just made. <laughs> and you go there because someone's being kind. They're talking about what you want to talk about. Sitting where you want to sit and just uh, drinking what you want to drink. Now you can understand when you sit down and meditate and you know, invite the body, how long do you want to sit for? I'm not quite sure yet. Okay, whenever you've had enough, let me know, we'll get up. What do you want to meditate on? How long do you want to sit, body? When you're not a control freak, you find your body and everything else complies with you your friends. And that's a trick to overcome the wandering mind. Sometimes my mind it just has some business it wants to do. And if I say, well, can we do it later? And sometimes my mind says, no, we've got to do it now. I say, okay. So I spend five minutes doing that and afterwards I might say, oh, thank you. Now we can go back to the meditation. It's like a, uh, almost like a, uh, a deal. You look after me, and I look after you. That means the meditation goes so much easier. And so because I don't fight the mind, the mind doesn't fight me, you don't get as much sloth and torpor. Most sloth and torpor is coming because you spend half the time fighting restlessness and then you get sloth and torpor as a result. You get worn out. So instead of fighting sloth and torpor, if you feel a bit tired, as I said, the best way of overcoming that sluggishness is to go to bed. Have a rest. Later on in the retreat, if you still have that sloth and torpor, just be kind to the sloth and torpor. You know, for so many years again in Thailand, we always had some sort of sleepiness. And I tried everything to overcome sleepiness, including the matchbox technique. You take the cover off the matchbox, so you just have the tray with all the matches in it, and you put it on top of your head. 
And if you get sleepy, it falls off your head onto the floor and you hear it. So do all the other monks doing the meditation, they hear it too. So you really know if you started to fall asleep with a matchbox. But it was amazing. It took about two or three days and I overcame my sloth and torpor by putting the matchbox on top of my head without the cover on and it never fell off. And I thought, wow, now I've overcome this terrible hindrance called sloth and torpor. Until one of the monks took me aside and said, we were watching you, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, we know that that matchbox never fell off your head, but the reason is that when you started getting sleepy, instead of going like that, you went like this. <laughs> Your mind can be very tricky. But then, the thing which really overcame that sort of talk of finding out its causes was when I had the opportunity to go down from the northeast of Thailand to Bangkok to do visas. And it was a monastery called Wat Bawan in the center of Bangkok. Uh, they allowed us to stay there, but they had just built a new building for visiting monks like us. We could stay there for a few days. And number one, that when we went on our arms round in the morning for our meal, we had Bangkok food, not just uh, sticky rice and frog soup. Honestly, that the meals we had in those days was disgusting, and there's also hardly any nutrition at all. So I was malnourished. I make up for it now. <laughs> but if you've seen photographs of me when I was a young monk, I was really thin. But anyway, that, so now in Bangkok, I was properly nourished. When I was in the northeast of Thailand, I was very diligent. Ajahn Chah asked me to only sleep four hours a day. If you had a nap in the afternoon, that was included. I couldn't get it below four and a half. So I was actually more sleep deprived. And we were meditating in the morning in the jungle and it was very really hot and humid. I was born in London. I was not used to such heat and such humidity. And it was only when I went to Bangkok, had a good rest, it was more than four and a half hours a day when I was resting because no one was there to check you out. <laughs> and number two, I was well fed and we found this hall which had an air conditioning unit so we could actually turn it on and we could sit there in nice cool temperatures like here and I found I could sit so perfectly I didn't have sloth and torpor at all every morning it was really nice and I realized it wasn't a personal failure it was just conditions of sleep, food and the climate they weren't really suitable. I'd only just came to Thailand. Sometimes, I'm not being disrespectful, even if the Buddha was born in London, he would have probably had a difficult time in the hot weather of uh, India. It was cause and effect, that's all. So once you realize it's not a personal failure, you can sit here and just try and make sure if you are cold, wear the blanket or wear the, the hat, if you are warm, see if you can take something off. Not too much, please, to the monks here. <laughs> and or turn the aircon on. Have enough rest. You know, that's one of the reasons why when I do go on a retreat, please excuse me if I'm not here sitting with you. Because sometimes when I sit in the room, there's an aircon in there and I've figured out how to get the best temperature now. And physically, it's more comfortable. If I do get too hot, I can always take the, the top robe off and sit nice and peaceful and calm and quiet. The same with you. You don't have to sit in this room. If you find a nice little corner somewhere, maybe in your bedroom or somewhere quiet, which is more conducive, please sit there. 
you know what to do. You just need to have the conditions around you which are supportive of meditation. So that's where I found out what causes that peace. And when I was happy in this moment, I never wanted to go anywhere. I know that people are saying it's, it's part of Buddhist meditation practice, the importance of being in the present moment. But how do you do that? How can you let go of the past and future? And the way you do that, which so few people notice, is first of all you've got to be kind to the past and kind to your future. And then it softens the past and the future enough for you to be able to let go of it. I don't know what's happened to you in the past. We've all had our traumas and our difficulties and our unexpected and undeserved problems of life. We've all gone through that. What do you do about it? People who blame themselves say, you shouldn't have done that, oh, I was a terrible person. Please, be kind to yourself. When you are kind, it's much easier to forgive and let it go. You're just a human being doing the best you could. A good example of that, for all the women here, don't put your hand up please, but how many of you have had abortions? I know many Buddhist women, that they have had abortions, and sometimes it's the majority of women, and they feel so guilty. You didn't have much of a choice, did you? There was a difficult decision either which way. It's a killing another being. But please be kind to yourself. As a monk, I hope you feel that I'm a wise monk, but I've had a lot of experience as a monk. And every time somebody comes up to me and says they had an abortion, I said, look, I'm a man. There's no way in the world I'll ever be able to fully appreciate what you were going through. But one thing which I can tell you, because I've been doing this conversation for years, I never yet met a woman who made that decision just heedlessly. You really try and think and find what possibilities there are, what options you have. It's one of those decisions you really make really carefully, the most careful decision of your life. And you're being mindful, you try your very best. And so if you ask me, I would always say, well, I will never be able to make that decision for you. But one thing I can promise you, whichever decision you make to abort or to try and keep that child in, growing in your belly, whichever decision you make, I will never criticize you ever. You'll always be welcome in any Buddhist society which I am involved in. Because you can't criticize that, it's just way too difficult. So because of that, give care. And when you have compassion and kindness to yourself, it's so much easier to let it go. You learn from it, and make sure you're a bit more careful next time, as best you possibly can. But you're caring for yourself and caring for others. That makes it easier to let it go. And those people who find it difficult to worry, they're worrying about the future. Maybe they have got a cancer and it's getting worse and worse. You say, oh my goodness, I don't think I can last with this. Please care for yourself. Care for your cancer. In other words, when you care for things, it's that old story, I'm going to say this again, another one of these old stories, of the monster in the Empress's palace. So once upon a time, I think I'm being a bit too serious, so I'm going to give a nice story now. Once upon a time, there was an Empress Every now and again I say an emperor, but I notice there's more women in this room today. So in, in order to, 
to get more support, an empress. And she came on one of the retreats run by the BGF. And you know, it's amazing sometimes you get sort of uh, royalty and stuff come to some of the retreats. There was one, I don't know if I should say this, but she, oh, I think it was long enough ago, I was giving a talk in, uh, yeah, Sup not Subang Chai, but it's north of Singapore, that's Johor. Johor. So the organizer, that was Dr. Wong. And he told me, he said, look, there's a royalty coming. She read your book and she really likes it. So please don't let anybody know, otherwise she might get in trouble. And of course, they all recognized her. <laughs> so she sat in for one of those talks. But suppose it was not just a princess, but royalty. Not like she's royalty, I suppose, but an empress. She came to listen to the talk. She enjoyed the talk and the retreat. And after, when she left, she went back to her palace. And she found this monster had come into her palace. And the reason why this monster had managed to gain entry into her palace, this monster was so big and so ugly, so terrifying, that even the guards who were trained by the military, even the guards were scared. And some of these security guards, they hid under the tables, they went into the broom cupboards, they hid behind the pot plants. And that allowed this monster to go right into the, the main room of the palace and sit on the Empress's throne. And that was just one step too far. So all the security guards came out of their covers, came out from underneath the tables, and they said, Monster, get out of here. You don't belong. Why are you in here? This is our Empress's chair. When she gets back, you'll be in big trouble. Get out now. And those few unkind words and unkind gestures made the monster grow a couple of inches bigger, more ugly, more violent, and more threatening. And that made the security even more upset. We told you to get out. If you don't get out by yourself, we'll carve out your butt with our, our swords. We'll spray you with machine gun fire. You'll wish you'd never been born. But actually, monsters don't get born. They arrive in those monster realms. Arise, they're not actually born. <laughs> so, uh, every unkind word, unkind deed, unkind thought, the, emperor, the monster kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger until this monster was huge and so frightening that even Steven Spielberg, with all the resources of DreamWorks, could not manage to create a monster so frightening. Who's the most frightening? What's the most frightening monster you've ever seen? Somebody did say alien in one of the movies, but I don't know, I've never seen that. Is that frightening? Yeah, okay. But anyway, the most frightening monster you've ever seen. And it was so violent, and the speech was so terrible, and the smell coming off this monster was so bad that even there were maggots crawling on this monster, and even the maggots threw up, they were sick. <laughs> but when the Empress came back, the reason why she was the Empress was because she was the smartest of all the people in the kingdom. And as soon as the Empress saw this ugly, frightening, stinky monster, she said, Welcome. Thank you for coming. Why have you spent such a long time not coming here? Thank you for dropping in. Has anybody got you something to drink yet? Yeah? We've got water, we've got some peppermint tea. We can say Tay Tarek if you wish. And the monster said, no. And so she ordered some of her so-called security to go and brew a cup of tea for this monster. What would you like to eat, monster? And what can you feed a monster? I don't know if you have this in KL, 
In Australia, many of the pizza shops have monster-sized pizzas. <laughs> so they order a pizza for the monster. Well, not that, that's not the only thing you can do for a monster. They noticed just how big his feet were. And so a dozen soldiers, they gave him a foot massage. And he, the monster really loved that. He said, just over here, we'll just say, oh, 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 oh that's wonderful, thank you so much. <laughs> and some gave him a shoulder massage because the monster's head was so big. Of course, he had a neck ache all the time. And every kind act, kind word or kind thought, the monster grew an inch smaller, less ugly, less violent, less smelly, less offensive. So they kept on going on like that until the monster was the same size when it first came into the palace. And then they kept on going. Before the, the pizza boy arrived with the monster-sized pizza, that monster was so small that one more act of kindness and the monster vanished completely away. And that's based on a story in the Yaka Samyutta. It's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And the Buddha called that anger-eating monsters. Cancer is an anger-eating monster. Get out of here, tumor. You don't belong. Get out. That's not the right way to deal with tumors. Welcome, tumor. Thank you for visiting me. Can you do that? Give it loving kindness, non-aggression. I've been teaching in these cancer places for 37 years. Oh, 30, yeah, about 37 years now. They invite me back every year. There must be something to this. Of course there is. So this is why we have this beautiful kindness. And that kindness relaxes you, takes away the fear, and allows things to heal. That's why it works. So you sit here, you have this beautiful peace and kindness. You get so peaceful, your mindfulness becomes strong. And because the mindfulness does become strong, it's pretty easy to do things like watching your breathing. In fact, the breath just comes up by itself. This is one of the reasons why I introduced that old anecdote when I first came to Malaysia. They said, meditation headache. Please don't do that. Watching something like the breath, when there's enough mindfulness, to watch the breath naturally, easily. And if you practice like that, develop your mindfulness, relaxation, rest, lack of stress and wanting, uh, stoth and torpor being eased off, then the breath just comes to you. Natural, peaceful, and it stays for a long period of time. Easy, and it's pleasant. It only does that if you build up the mindfulness first of all. Which is one of the reasons why in the Anapanasati Sutta, the first thing, one of the first things which the Buddha says, you know, find a nice, comfortable place. The Buddha does say to sit up straight, but that's only if that's comfortable for you. And then to establish mindfulness as a priority. That is my translation for what other people say, to set up mindfulness in front of you. What does it mean, mindfulness in front of you? Where do you live? I don't live behind my nose, so it can't be here. Is it behind your heart? What does it mean in front of you? It doesn't mean that at all. The Pali word, if I'm not mistaken, is parimukham. Yes, it does mean in front. But it means like in front, like the list. I always say that Establish mindfulness as the priority at the beginning of the meditation. So once you have that mindfulness nice and strong, it's just so easy and pleasant. 
to watch the press. It's not a difficulty at all. So once you have that mindfulness, you start watching the breath, then the meditation starts to take off. You don't have meditation headache. You don't have to fight with sloth and torpor. You don't have to worry about the wandering mind. You can actually stay still because you're enjoying being here. You relax and having a good time. <laughs> People sometimes laugh at me. What do you mean, having a good time when you're meditating? Isn't that indulging? Yes. Are you supposed to indulge as a monk? Depends what you're indulging in. And that's one of the suttas I keep on quoting, Pasadika Sutta, the Diga Nikaya. When the Buddha was saying to one of his monks, if people ask you, said, do you indulge in happiness? You should answer yes. What type of happiness? Not the happiness of the five senses, the happiness of meditation. And if you indulge in the happiness of meditation, said the Buddha, you can tell the people, you can only expect four results of indulging in the happiness of meditation. What are those four results of indulging in the happiness of meditation? Stream winning, once returning, non-returning, or full enlightenment. That's what you're supposed to be doing. So the Buddha said, indulge. What a wonderful thing that is on a meditation retreat. You can indulge in happiness and joy and have the time of your life as should be expected when you come to Club Med Ampang. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Ooh, very okay, sounded very good. So it's now, so it's now 10.30. So what time is the next appointment? 11.30 for lunch or something? Eleven thirty. So now you can meditate here. You can go down and smell out, see if the lunch is worth it. Go and have a break, have a rest, whatever you need to do. You can come up and adjust the senior monk's robes. <laughs> and sometimes people ask, Ajahn Brahm, you've been a monk for such a long time, why do your robes fall off? And the answer is to give this monk an opportunity to make good karma. It's done out of compassion for you. Maybe, I'm not sure, but do, does anyone want to ask a question first of all about that talk? Or I noticed some monks in the front were writing down a few notes. Is that any questions? We're having an interview today? We are? Okay, I did. Okay, that's now. Ah. Okay, sorry guys. Maybe. So the interviews are downstairs? Okay. Very good. Okay, so interviews. I'm a very busy monk. Over in the West, we say, no peace for the wicked. <laughs>